So this uh, story which is told a few times in the Quran is the story of Adam and Hawa. Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam are our parents. These are the two parents of Banu Adam. We're called Banu Adam, which is the children of Adam. And the class today is about children. And how this all started is a really interesting story. How, how did we get here? Because it's still going on, the story. I mean, this story that happened here, this primal story, is still going on. It's still being played out again and again. And it's in Surah Al-Araf here. The story is a story about two creatures, Adam and Iblis. And really three, because Hawa is there and she's spoken to in the same with Huma. You know, Allah uses the dual again and again in this story. And they're both very important. And God, Nada Huma, he spoke to the both of them. So he actually spoke to both of these two people. Now, this other character is Iblis. There's a khilaf about Iblis, about his nature. The dominant opinion is that he was a jinn, but he was allowed into the court of the angels, this angelic court. Now, these angels were told by God to bow down to Adam. And that sujood is not a prostration. It's not actually putting your head on the ground. It was a type of ta'zim, which was more like an inhina. It was bowing. And it could have been sujood because even prior to the Prophet's mission, there was not a prohibition about making sujood to other people. But the Prophet ﷺ was prohibited from making sujood to anyone else, male or female. That it's haram to actually bow down to any human being uh, with belief. I mean, you shouldn't do it in any case, but you might have to get down to help somebody with their shoe. or some, you, There's a lot of reasons why you could actually do the physical act. Uh, so that's not what's haram. What's haram is to actually bow down thinking that those people uh, have any uh, divine quality or anything worthy of that type of exaltation. But we know that some of the Sahaba actually fell down, one prostrated to the Prophet ﷺ, and he f forbade him from doing that. But it has to be with the belief, obviously, that it was shirk. So Iblis is told to bow down, and, he, and he's the only one that doesn't do it, because all of them did it, except Iblis. فَسَجِدُوا إِلَّا Iblisa, And that's why some of the ulama say the illa, the mustathna here, is the mustathna minhu, is the angels. In other words, the exception, he's accepted from the angels. So in order to be accepted from the angels, it would be that he was an angel also. But in Arabic, they have an interesting thing. You can say all of them, all the men got up except the donkey. In English, we wouldn't really say that. Whereas in, in Arabic, they have that type of of separation between the, the subject and what's being accepted from it. So it's uh, an interesting debate. But he says, What has hindered you from not falling prostrate? Because I told you to do this. I'm better than him. Which is a very interesting statement. Because some of the ulama say this is the first wrong action ever. And it's a belief of superiority. It's a belief of superiority of another creature. So he said, I'm better than him. And then, خَلَقْتَنِي مِنْ نَارِ Then he gives the reason. This is his logic of why he is superior. You created me from fire, وَخَلَقْتُهُ مِنْ طِينَ And you created him from earth and water. I'm fire and air, he's earth and water. I'm better than him. What was the superiority here? What superiority did he see? Material, right? It's, it's medda. He's looking at the actual substance of what we are made of. Now, what is unique about Iblis and Adam. 
That's part of it. But where does that come from? And what did Allah give both Iblis and Adam? The, he, they have this conscious ruah. They have this conscious knowledge of God that other creatures don't have, whether they're made of fire, earth, water, whatever they're made of. So Iblis was looking at the outward of the situation and he's saying, I'm better than him. Why are you making me bow down to somebody that I'm better than? This is his logic. And there's a lot of people that fall into that type of reasoning in the world. And it causes immense problems in the world. Then go down. Now this is a command to him. It is not for thee to show pride here. In other words, you're in the divine presence. This isn't the place for pride. If you're aware of God, you can't be in a state of pride. And therefore, he was cast out of this presence because the two can't go together. And then he says, فخرج إنك من الصاغرين. Get out of here because you are the sagir. You're not better, you're worse. You're the humiliated one because of your pride. Because of your pride, you've put yourself under the thing that you thought you were over. So the actual thinking that you were over this other creature has put you under that creature by default. So go out. And then he says, قَالَ أَنظُرْنِي أَنظُرْنِي إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Give me some reprieve. Give me some reprieve until the ba'ath. And this is a proof that Iblis believed in the ba'ath, he believed in the angels, he believed in Allah, the Qadr, he believed in everything. His kufr is called kufr al-isyan. It's the disbelief of disobedience. Because it's not the same as, if you're in the divine presence and you disobey Allah, it's, it's like somebody in Mecca who does something, a kabira in Mecca. It's unimaginable to any person with an ounce of faith in their heart that you could do a kabira, a major wrong action in Mecca. But there are people that do that. So, You've got this reprieve. This is really key here. Bima agwaitani now, because you led me astray. Right? So he's blaming, now he blames Allah. This is the beauty of Iblis. I mean, he's, he's just, that's what Fakhruddin al-Razi says. Look at this foolish intellect. First, he says, why didn't you do it? And he says, because I can't do that, I'm better than him. Then he says, you made me go astray by telling me to do it in the first place. Because I couldn't do it, you said do it. And, and so it's your fault. <laughs> it's not my fault, it's your fault. See, that's, he's blaming God. For his problems. I will now lurk in ambush for them. In other words, these humans. Because it's really their fault. You told me to do this thing. So it's both of your faults. You told me to do something that I couldn't do. And the reason I couldn't do it is because he wasn't worthy of it. So he's got two... He, he's got two adversaries here. He's angry at God and he's angry at Adam. And then he says, And I will come upon them from before them, and behind them, and to their rights, and to their lefts, and you will not find most of them uh, filled with gratitude. So this is, this is important too because what Iblis has set out to do now is show that they're ingrates. That's what he wants to do. He wants to show God that you made a mistake, you shouldn't have made him the Khalifa, the Caliph on earth, and you're going to see that they're, they're not going to be grateful for what you've given them in the first place. This is what he wants to do. Now what's interesting, uh, Ibn, Ibn al-Hajj mentions that when he says, I'll come... Before them, behind them, to their right, to their left. He didn't mention two directions. So he's got four directions. right? And there's six directions. There's the zenith, the nadir, 
and then the four cardinal directions. He says he'll come on all those four cardinal directions, but he won't come from above or below. He didn't say, min فوقهم ومن تحتهم. I won't come from over them or below them. The reason that the commentators say that is because what comes from above is revelation. And as long as you have a connection with God, he, can't, he doesn't have access to that. He can't cut you off from God unless you cut yourself off. And he can't come from under because that's a place of humility. And he's arrogant. He wouldn't put himself under you. So you being humble, it, it, that's why, when does shaitan flee according to the hadith? When you're in sajda. He, because he can't bear that. Humility before God. And so it's very interesting this story because what it's telling us is that if you place God in his right position and you place yourself in your right position which is that you see God over you and you're under in prostration in this state of submission shaitan has no access but as long as you're wandering around in this uh, horizontal field not in a vertical state right because the vertical is up down horizontal is looking around on this plane, it's the material plane. It's, it's two dimensions. You're not allowing for that vertical plane and so you're lost. You're lost. And the whole point of being upright is that you are vertical on a horizontal plane. If you go horizontal, right, lie down on the job, <laughs> then he gets in there. That's why it's very easy for him, especially sleep is a really easy time. If you don't do wudu, you don't do those things. I mean, those are all hadith about that. And then Allah again, qada khruj minha, madhuman madhura. He banished him again, degraded, banished. And then he says that whoever follows you, minhum minkum I'm going to fill jahannam with them. Those people that follow you, they're, you're their imam. And you're headed to that place, so he, you're going to take them with you. So if you take him as an imam, that's where he's taking you. And then it says, after that, Ya Adam. Now he goes, speaks to Adam, who's the khalifa who just, the angels were told to bow down to him. He says, Ya Adam, O Adam, Uskunanta wa zawjuka, go live, you and your wife, al jannata in this paradise. Fakula min haythu shi'tuma. And eat from whence you will, wherever you want. But don't go near this tree over here. Because you will transgress by doing that. So here's all the boundaries and here's the hudud. These are the, those are called the hudud. This is what the beautiful hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ says, الحلال الحلال That halal is clear, haram is clear. What's, what's permitted, what's prohibited, it's all clear. And between them are these gray matters. So he's basically told everything here is for you except this one thing. Don't go there. And he tells him, if you go there, you'll be from the wrongdoers, the vadama. Tadhirimu nafsak wa tadhirimu haqqallah. You not only wrong yourselves, but you wrong the right of Allah. You don't harm Allah. You can't do anything to Allah. But you can transgress a haqq, what is due to Allah. And what is due is that Allah is obeyed if he tells you to do something. Now, at this point it says, فَوَسْوَسَدَهُمَ shaitan." So shaitan came and he waswasa. Now, if you know, this is a, a type of word that actually sounds like the action. The Arabs have some words that sound like the action, animatpateic, I think they call it in English. Like buzz. Buzz is one of those words in English. It sounds like a bee buzzing. This word is, waswasa is to whisper. You can even hear it in English, whisper. I mean, it's similar, maybe even a cognate if you get back far enough. Fawaswasadahuma. Shaitan waswasa lahuma. Now waswasa lahuma, the Arabs say waswasa ilayhi, waswasa lahuma. Waswasa lahuma is different from waswasa ilayhi. If you said waswasa ilayhi, it means shaitan whispered to them. But when you say waswasa lahuma, it's that he did it because of something. He want, he, in other words, he had some goal here. For waswasa lahuma. 
He whispered to them for a reason. And, and the amazing thing about whispering is whenever somebody lowers their voice to a whisper, it's always a very interesting moment. Because why, what changed that they didn't want somebody to hear something or they're worried? I just want to tell you. I mean, there's something going on with a whisper that's very interesting. It's like you'll be intimate because you love somebody, things like that. And that's, again, because you don't want anybody to hear. It's just for, the, it's for your ears only. Right? That, that, that's a lover's whisper. But here, there's another type of whisper. And there's even what's called khianat al-ayun. The Arabs call it khianat al-ayun, which is when the king or some person in charge, I mean, there's plenty of Arab rulers now that probably are very good at this. It's looking with your eye that indicates to the others, get rid of him. And you see it a lot uh, in, you know, it's kind of a Shakespearean motif. <laughs> you know, he looks at him and you know what to do. And then you know that's it for that person, right? They don't come back in the play. So this is, this is what he's up to. He's, he's got this, فَوَسْوَسَ uh, لَهُمَ shaitan لِيُبْدِيَ لَهُمَ Now, th- there's a difference about this lamb, and this is one of the things about tafsir. Some people say that that lamb is lamb al-ta'qib or lamb al-aqiba or the lamb of sayrura, the Arabs call it, which is a lamb that's used, like if you look, how does he translate it here in the English? He says, then Satan whispered to them that he might manifest unto them that which was hidden. In other words, he did it for that reason. That is not the opinion of some of the Mufassir. They say the lamb is actually like the lamb in the Quran about Al-Fir'aun. It says, فَالْتَقَطَهُ آلُ فِرْعَونَ آلُ فِرْعَونَ When they took Musa لِيَتَّخِذُهُ لِيَكُونَ لَهُمْ عَدُوًا وَحُزْنًا That they took Musa and then it says لِيَكُونَ لَهُمْ And it looks like in order for them, him to be an enemy for them and to be a source of grief, well, that's obviously, they didn't do that for that reason. So the lamb there is, but that's what happens because of doing that. So this lamb here could either mean that he did it in order to do that, or it means that that was the result of him doing it. That in order to show them, or, and this resulted in them seeing, right? That which was hidden from them. Min so atihima from their nakedness. Now, so'a in Arabic, the Arabs call private parts the so'a. And the reason they do that is because kashfuhu yasu'uhu, that if it's exposed, he feels uh, shame. Now, what's interesting is, is that there's a belief amongst most of the scholars that the so'a, this desire to cover the nakedness, is fitra which is why the vast majority of Aboriginal people cover their private parts. There are very, very few human beings on the planet that go around naked. And even the ones that do will tend to do something. I mean, even if you look at these Aboriginal peoples in South America, they tend to cover or they strap or they do something because it's part of the fitra of doing this. And it always fascinated me, these books in evolution where they'll show the monkey, and then at a certain point, he's wearing a garment. And you just wonder why he did that. So at a certain point, he thought, you know, I should cover this part of me. What made him do that? Right? I mean, you can look in those books. I always wondered about that, you know, because suddenly it's a Cro-Magnum man or something like that, and and he's wearing, you know, a little skimpy thing around there. It's not like he's suddenly in a tuxedo or... I mean, he's, he's just progressed to that stage of being aware of his nakedness. And this is the point of this story, is that he became aware of his nakedness. Now, some of the ulama say that they had garments of light and that's what was removed. Uh, that they were in a state of just such intense purity that their whole bodies were veiled in this light. And you can have a situation where you actually can, that happens, you can see somebody in a type of, they call it a hala, the Arabs call it a hala. In English they call it a halo. You often see like Byzantine, these icons of these Byzantine 
uh, Pia. I mean, where do they get that concept from uh, if there wasn't some experience of that somehow, this idea of this, this body of light that, that can actually surround somebody? I mean, I was telling my, one of my boys we were uh, leaving one day, and, and uh, we did a dua in, uh, in the car, and I said, that dua is for protection. And he said, uh, how does it protect you? And I said, well, if you do it, you're recognizing that you're in need of God's protection. And just that recognition alone, God will put this protection around you for that reason. And he said, oh, so is it like a bubble of light that goes around you? And I said, that sounds good. (laughs) 